So it's, it's the year of the mouth. That's the whole point. We, we're going to be talking. We, you've got to open your mouth. You've got to find somebody. And just tell them about Jesus and then invite them to church. A vast majority are not coming. And Isaiah, it says, you know, he was, saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he said, okay, who's going to go for us and all that? And he says, uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to send. He said, yeah, well, here's the problem. They're not going to listen to you. Hey, uh, uh, you told me to go and speak all this stuff. And then he said, no, they're not actually going to come because they got hard hearts and their ears are closed and they're not coming. But he's going to use that on the final day as a, as a, as a, a, a judgment. He said, you've heard. That Jewish guy has heard now about his, their Messiah. So uh, that's what it's going to be. So narrow is the gate. A few that go in that narrow gate and, and, and broad is the way that lead us to destruction. Many are going in there. So there's going to be a great falling away. But we are just commissioned to tell. It doesn't matter whether they listen. That's not on my side of the equation. I'm responsible to tell. If I don't tell them, I'm dropping the ball. And I'm not interested in souls. So we give people opportunity. Invite them to church. And that's, that's the commission. You know, the old adage, we use it, each one win one. If you in your life just win one person to the Lord and bring them to church, in one year we double the size of the congregation. Two years, it's right. But that, uh, that really rarely takes place. But I think at some point, this is going to get, this is going to drop into our hearts, right? It's going to drop in and it's just going to, we're just going to get something more than just the going through the, the outward motions. And I know, we, you know, many of you have a heart for God. You're born again. You love Jesus. But it's going to be, the fire is going to hit us. That's what I'm thinking. The fire is going to hit. And uh, that's what we're talking. And Sunday uh, in the morning at 930, uh, we have a, 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 a Francis Chan is pr t teaching about Mark. One thing about old Francis Chan He's got an enthusiasm level that's like a 9 out of 10. And, and the whole thing, and, I, and I've been preaching a little bit about this, and this is the goal, the, the, the walk in the awe of God, the reverence of God, in the, and in, holy, in a holy life, being, making a difference in the world, that there's some energy in that, and there's a fire in that, and there's a, there's a new passion in it that moves us beyond what we're, that where we currently are at, myself included. And I've been asking the Lord that he would be, uh, he would be so uh, revered and, and I would walk in the awe of God and everything that we see and how we live life. I came out of Walmart the other day and I, this hits me oftentimes and I'm just walking across there and, and I said, and, and it was a warm day and I'm, it's, it's February and it was like 70 degrees. I went, oh my goodness. What a, and the sky was blue and it, it was just, I, just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I was, in the, I was in Planet Fitness yesterday, and I'm just working out, and there's one, one guy has no hands. He's got a little tiny little fingers on this hand and nothing on this hand. He's there working out. And another girl, she's on oxygen, carrying her oxygen around and pumping weights. And another guy must have had a stroke. He's got a cane, and he's in the workout. And he's a, not an old guy, maybe 50 or something. Some that's old, but for others, it's not really old. And he's just walking. I said, oh, God. Oh, I came to Kathy. I said, oh, God. I said, I'm so blessed. And I'm so thankful in that I have you in my heart. I'm going to heaven. And, and that we have, we have purpose in life and, and goals. And there's so much to this. And I'm in awe of you, Lord. See, I want to live in that place. That's, that's where I want to live in that. And, and it, your whole life, you never be depressed right there. You can't, you can't be depressed. You can't try to be depressed. You can't do it. It's when you're sucked into this world system that that's where you go. And I've said all of that, and I'm, uh, I've, uh, I'm not getting into my message here, but I'm going to get to it. So this is all about the, po the priesthood, right? And you don't have to look at this. Ezekiel 22, 26, here's what it says. Her priests have violated my law. The priests, now we're a kingdom of priests, but back in the day they had priests. It's kind of like rulers, you know, they were religious authorities. And they have profaned my holy things in the temple. They profaned them. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Now think about that. They put no difference. You couldn't tell. These guys, holy, profane, was nothing to them, no, no reverence for God. Neither have they showed a difference between the clean and the unclean and have hid their eyes from my Sabbath. And I am profane. I am defiled. I am stained among them. That's the real problem. Because we represent the Lord. We carry his life. We are called Christians. And if we, don't live, if we live our lives in a, in a, in a way that is detrimental to that, to, that, uh, to that witness, we profane him. 
Now, I said, this is what the prophet is saying. Now, here's what it says, 2 Corinthians uh, Peter 2, 5. Covered this last week. Ye are also living stones and are built up. You're a living stone. Remember that guy uh, who went out to, uh, who went out to uh, Mr. Livingstone? The verse is 1 Peter 2.5. 1 Peter 2.5. What was his name? Mr. Livingston. He went out to Africa as a missionary. Huh? David. David Livingston. But living stone, that's where it comes from. We are a living stone and are built up a spiritual house. Now, you can't build a house with one living stone, right? So that's the church. We are a house. And, oh, by the way, two in the 5782, forgot, is a what? It's a house. It's a tent. It's a dwelling place. So this is the year to build your spiritual house your, and your home, not your own, your own life. Your, your temple, your house, your home is a house. And then the church. This is the house. This is the living stones. Right. And uh, a whole, you're a holy priesthood. So now you're a priest, too. Old Testament just had certain the Levites and the, and the sons of Aaron, Aaronic priesthood. That was a unique group of people. He said, no, now you're all priests. So you are not just a priest, but a holy priesthood because the Holy Spirit lives in you and ought to offer up not just regular sacrifices, but their spiritual sacrifices. And they're acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. They can only be acceptable through him. So now that's what you and I are. We bring our sacrifices to the Lord, and whatever you give to the Lord is a, a holy sacrifice. And how you bring that sacrifice is the thing. You know, how do you, when you gave this morning, you uh, brought your money. How do we come uh, when you sing unto the Lord in praise and worship? That's uh, the, the, uh, our, our, the fruit of our lips. You know, the, we offer up praise uh, continually to the Lord, the fruit of our lips. That's an offering. That's a holy, that's a sac holy sacrifice. The question is going to be, how do we offer that up? What's going on inside of us? as we offer these things up, even in your private time? Do you have that sense of awe and, and sense of my, what a privilege it is for me to offer this up to the Lord? Because we are now a spiritual house, we are priests, and we have a sacrifice to bring. They said that back in those days, there was a problem in the temple. And that's what we're going to extract out of this and apply it to ourselves, all right? So the, there's, there's two groups of, of uh, two fathers, two who are priests. One is called Aaron and one is called Eli. And uh, they emerge in uh, Leviticus and then in, in uh, 1 Samuel. And there's a gap of about a couple, I think it's about 400 years. I might be wrong on that, but there's a gap. So there's two fathers and they both have two sons. Right? And there's two fathers and two sons. The problem with this primarily is the fathers. The fathers as we go through this. Now listen, I'm going to go through it pretty quickly because we're going to run out of time. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. This is, the one, this is the problem of strange fire. This is what happens. And Nadab and Abihu. Those are cool names. If you have a child, you want to name your child something, you call them Nadab or Abihu. The sons of Aaron. Now, this was during the time of Moses, all right? And this was, in other words, the anointing of God was very strong because it was the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day, the, the, the Shekinah glory. It was in the temple, power, God's earth. Okay. And uh, they're sons of Aaron and took either of them, and they took either of them, both of them, and his censer, and they put fire in the censer, and put incense in it and offered up strange fire, which means unholy fire, before the Lord, which he commanded not. All right, you got the father, Aaron, you got the two boys, the two boys are going in and offer up strange fire. The fire is uh, uh, an incense, it's like a pan and it's got a holder on it and, you, and the incense goes in there. You go, you go and you get the fire from where? from the altar of, uh, of sacrifice. That's where the fire comes from. You've got to go to the altar of sacrifice. That is always a picture of Christ, right? That's where the, the, uh, the sacrifice was made, at that altar. And they brought that then and put the incense in it. It was holy, and they went into the, uh, uh, the holy place. And, uh, and then eventually the, only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. But they would offer that up to the Lord. He said, you didn't do it according to the commands. You didn't follow the rules. 
And the reason they didn't follow the rules is because dad was not following, there was not instructing them in the way of uh, the things of God. Now listen, and then there went out from the Lord a fire and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now think about that. Uh, Hebrews 12, 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. Remember with uh, Elijah, and he had the sacrifice, and he challenged the prophets of Baal, and he put everything out there, and, the, and what came out of heaven? The fire, and it consumed the offering. God is a consumer. He didn't consume the fire. He consumed the two kids. He said, they're gone. Then Moses said unto Aaron, Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Now let this penetrate. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. He said, and it was, it was God's judgment. It was judgment. Leviticus 10.3 uh, says in the uh, Amplified, then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord uh, meant when he said, I will be acknowledged and I will be hallowed by those who come near me. And before all the people, I will be honored. He said, I I'm going to be glorified. Now, when you think about that, when we approach the Lord, there's something about when in our priesthood, when we're bringing our sacrifice, it's got to be a, a holy sacrifice, a spiritual sacrifice. It has to be approved by God. And it was not. It was called strange fire. Now, there's a few unacceptable, uh, inexcusable things with, this, with these two boys. Number one, they had seen the miracles of God in the wilderness. They saw the glory of God on the tabernacle. But when they came in, they wanted to do things as it were their way. And that was not authorized. There was arrogance. There was religious pride. There was carelessness. There was irreverence. Process the words. Uh, they did not sanctify the Lord in their hearts, and they ignored God's clear instruction. But they wanted to do the church thing. He said, no, that's not going to work here. Now, this is Old Testament, so, uh, you know, there's something unique going on there. And the father had not intervened. That was the primary problem. When it says put a difference between the holy and the profane, that's what we do in our own life. We separate and say some things, uh, no, that's... I'm more conforming to the world. That's not really endorsed by God. I'm going to reject that. I'm coming back onto holy ground. It's in our homes where we as fathers, as men, say, no, this is God's house. And there are certain things that are allowed and certain things that are not. As a holy priest under the Lord, that home is under our jurisdiction as God's priest. And then finally, in the house of the Lord, we, we guard that. And we are... Uh, aware that the enemy so, uh, at times want to intrude and bring in another method, you know, other methods, a strange fire. Uh, s you know, one of the things I've thought about, and I'm not going to cast dispersions on everybody, but sometimes I think of the fog machines that we have in churches today as kind of like strange fire. Now, I don't want to make a blanket statement on that, but it's like we're going to do, we're going to make things look like this is the, like the presence of God is there. So we're going to use a methodology here that's really not endorsed by God. And we're going to make the, in the Old Testament, you know, the, the cloud came in and the presence of God came in as a cloud. So we're going to fabricate a cloud and make it look like on our platform that the glory of God is here. Now, maybe people don't think along those lines, but I would be troubled by that in fabricating something, and God will deal with that in each individual life. But there's a way to go about the things of God and how we approach Him and how we deal with things like and, and, and uh, approach communion table. And what I'm saying here, we, we, need to, we need to ramp this thing up and realize who we're dealing with here. And we're not just going through religious motions and traditions and ritual here. And we should not. We come with a fear of the Lord before us. Now, Leviticus 10, 8 through, uh, 8 through 10 says this, And the Lord said to Aaron, Lord speaking, Do not drink wine or strong drink, you or your sons, when you go into the tent of the meeting. And they believed that one of the, one of the failings of those boys was they were drinking. And they were drunk when they went in. They, did, they had no reverence for God. 
Lest you die, it shall be a statute forever of all your generations. You shall make a distinction and recognize the difference between the holy and the common, the unholy, and between the unclean and the clean. We make that distinction in our homes. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, which is your members and all your faculties, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, some add, of worship. Then he says this, do not be conformed to this world system. He said, make a difference between the holy and the profane, the, the godly and the ungodly, and uh, the clean and the unclean. He said, uh, don't be conformed to that world system, system that wants to conform you to its ways, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's what we want to be, a, a testimony and a witness of, the, of the, the glory of God, the holiness of God in a world that's unholy. Lights in the midst of the darkness. But I, there needs to be a, a revelation here, a moving of us to that next level of, of, of reverence before God in, in regard to our calling as, as priests. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the issue, on, uh, so to speak, on the table. And the question to you is, are you cognizant in and do you deal with the idea of your holy priesthood? Men or women, it doesn't matter because you're all holy priests. And how you carry his anointing in your life. Uh, and uh, whether it is approved and acceptable to God. Now, second is, is another family. These are the sons of Eli. This is sometime later. It's 1 Samuel 2, beginning in verse 12. Now, at the time of Eli, the anointing of God had dissipated over time. There was no sense of the Shekinah glory in the church at that time. And God is going to deal with these two boys differently. Here it is. And it begins on verse 12, and we're just going to bounce through a couple because it's a little more involved. We'll pick out a few verses to make the points. The sons of Eli were base and worthless. They did not know or regard the Lord. Now think about that. Uh, Eli, were you not instructing these children? Were you not placing demands on them? Were you not disciplining these children? Or were you just letting them willy-nilly go about their thing? the way they wanted to. They became base and worthless. The problem is on the father. Aaron was not, was not as diligent with those boys, and neither was Eli. So the sin of the two young men was great, was very great before the Lord, for they, did, listen to this, they despised the offering of the Lord. Now Eli was very old and heard that his sons what they did unto all Israel, and how they, listen, they laid with women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, what had happened prior to that, when the offerings were taken, uh, which they would bring uh, animal sacrifices, that's what they would bring, the people would bring animal sacrifices. These boys, what, and, and what you would do is, number one, you would take the fat and offer it to the Lord first. That was the most valuable part of the animal, whatever. Secondly, the, the, the person who brought the sacrifice would get a portion. Okay. And then what was left, the priest would put a hook in the, in, the bowl, in the cauldron, whatever it was cooking in, and whatever he hooked onto, he could pull out and use because the priests, the Levites, would be supplied by the congregation. So that's how it went. Lord first, then the parishioner would take their portion, and then the, they would take their last one. They said, well, guess what? We're, these guys said, we're going to take our part first. Not only will we take our part, but we're also going to take the, the parishioner. We're going to take more of theirs. And they threatened them. And they said, if, we don't, if you don't give us your portion, a por a more of your portion, we're going, to, we're going to send some people after you. So in other words, they could care less about the fat being offered first. They said, no, we're first. We get our portion, and we're going to take some of yours. So we've got a problem with that. See, they despised the offering. There was no reverence. No reverence for God. No sense of, of his holiness. They did not put a difference between the holy and the profane. Now, this is what happens. And the man of God came to Eli. We don't even know who it is. The man of God comes. Remember Nathan with David, the man of God? He says, oh, he asked him the question. He said, oh, you're the man. He said, the man of God comes. God sends and he says this to them. Thus has the Lord said... 
And it goes on to say, why then, verse 29 of 2 Samuel, why do you kick, which means trample upon and treat with contempt, my sacrifice and my offering, which I commanded, and honor, listen, honor your sons above me by fattening themselves upon the choicest part of every offering of my people Israel. So what he said, what we're going to do, what he was doing, he said, I'm going to uh, buckle under the behavior of my sons, and I'm going to disregard your holiness and your demands and requirements on this house. I'm going to put my sons before you. He said, that, now we've got a big problem here. This can even happen in a, in a, in a home, you know, a Christian home, where you can allow certain things to transpire in the home, and you know it may be wrong or sin. And you say, well, we'll give it a pass. No, you don't give it a pass because you're the priest over that home. You say, not in this house. You, you go out there, and you're on the street, I can't, I'm not going to follow you around, but not in this house. And that was the problem with this guy, Eli. He was not challenging these children. And he honored the sons above me by fattening themselves. First, and it goes up to verse 30. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel says this, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. That was the point. It's the house, the lineage. The house was supposed to walk before him forever. Lost my place. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor. And them that despise me, they're going to be despised. They're not going to have any credibility. You, when you honor the Lord, God will honor you. That's the principle. When you put him first and you revere the Lord... Now it goes on, 1 Samuel 22, 34, and here comes judgment. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons of Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Same, same ultimate fate. And I will raise up a faithful priesthood, which is the Zadok priesthood, more to be said about that at some other point, that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. I want a faithful priesthood. That's the question. Are we going to be, as priests under God, a faithful priesthood who will carry out the things of God in, in adoration, in awe, in reverence, in love of a holy God, that we will walk before him that way? And not compromise. Put a difference between the holy and the profane. Put a difference between the clean and the unclean. And take a stand when it's not popular. Because that world system wants to say, no, you've got to do it differently. You've got to let it in. You've got to let in the, the sexual perversion. You've got to let it in and honor it in your churches. They say, not in, not in God's church. No, sir. Regardless of the consequences of it, no, that will not come in. That's unclean. That's sexual perversion, and it's unclean, and we'll deal with it. God loves all those who are sinners. He wants to see them delivered, and we love them in that regard. If you're a drug addict or you're a, an adulterer or a fornicator, God wants to see you saved. But you don't endorse it. You don't allow it. You don't support it in God's house. Do you know how many Christians I talk to in counseling that they are Christians and everything? They're living together. They're fornicating. There's no, they're living in uncleanness. They don't even know it. Why? It's not taught. It is not taught, generally speaking, in the church because it'll cost you something, generally speaking. He said, I will build my house. I'm going to raise up that faithful priesthood. That's going to be in the end times because he's building this house, this spiritual house, in the end times. I'm going to build it. I will build him a sure house, and he will walk before mine anointed. That priesthood is going to walk before his anointed. The immediate application was Solomon, but... By extrapolation, it's the Lord. We will walk on the anointing because we will be honored and favored in the Lord because we won't bend. We won't buckle. We won't compromise. We will not do it because we, we are two. We walk in the reverence of God, the awe of God. We call it the fear of the Lord, and that's how we walk. That will be required in the end times in a way that is, has not been uh, over the m recent history. But as we move into the end times and the darkness begins to descend, it has descended, and the storm is now rising. Only those who are built on as ministers on that rock are going to endure. Now, here's the principle. The greater the glory, the swifter the judgment. The greater the glory, the swifter the judgment. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, they are singed at the door. They're gone. God consumes them. Boom, they're gone. Hophni and Phinehas, 
uh, it took them a while. You know what it took? When the Philistines came in and, and took the uh, Ark of the Covenant and there was a battle, it says that they were both killed in one day. They both died, just so it was prophesied. But it took some time. When the, glo- the, the greater the glory, because in that in the time of Moses, the glory was seen day and night. It was in the temple. The, the, the glory of the Lord was so te- intense. And God says, no, when that glory is there, the, the, the judgment is swift. Time of Eli was not that way at all, so it was, there was time. When Jesus came, when a New Testament, you say, well, where is that in the New Testament? Uh, I'll give you two examples, and then we'll talk about communion. We're going to have communion. Jesus said this, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable of the, of the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in the day of judgment for, than these cities. Why? Because he was the glory of God. He said, God is in your midst, and your judgment is going to be greater. He said, that judgment is going to be greater on you than Sodom and Gomorrah, because they didn't have a revelation. There was no glory in it. But he said, you got, there's a different judgment because I was here among you. How about Acts 5.5, 5, Ananias and Sapphira? At the early church, the glory of God was very tangible. I mean, it was, God was moving in such spectacular ways at Pentecost and all that was transpiring. And then Ananias comes up and, and, and he, uh, they give an offering and they lie. And they said, uh, everybody was selling everything they have and they were sharing everything. They come up, they said, oh yeah, we sold everything and we're all with you guys. And uh, the, the word of knowledge comes to Peter. He said, oh, really? He said, oh, is that true? Did you give it all? Well, yeah, I gave it all. And all of a sudden, he drops down dead. Why? Because he, he said, you lied to the Holy Ghost. He said, you've been uncovered. Your, your deeds of darkness have been exposed, and now, and now you're done for. And then in comes uh, Sapphira, and they ask her the same. They give her an opportunity. Are you going to lie or not? She lies as well and drops dead right there. Why so swift? Because of the glory. So now we're going to, we would, I think, agree and say, Lord, send your glory. Oh, okay. Think about the implications. Oh, Lord, send your, we want your presence, Lord. Show your presence that we can you know, feel your glory. He said, okay. What comes along with that is swift judgment. Because you can't, as it, were, as it were, get away with the things that you can, in a sense, get away with when there's, when there's little glory. Now, the presence of the Lord is always with us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. But I'm talking about what we call the, in, in the Old Testament the kabod of God. The kabod, which is the, the manifest weightiness. If you've been in some meetings, which I've, Kathy and I have been in over the years, where you feel that the glory cloud come in. It may not be smoke, but you know the Lord is there. And, and it's, it, there's a tangible sense of presence. It's no longer you're having a nice church service. He said, I, he just showed up. Now, in a, in a unique way, and you're, all of a sudden your knees go weak and you hard, find it hard to even stand up because the kabod of God is the weightiness of his presence, and you, you don't you want to just fall on your knees and just worship the Lord. And we've been in those places, in those meetings, where there's no, the worship team is, forget about it, they're gone. They're just worship just launches into, into a, a spiritual place, and the song of the Lord just rises and and it ebbs and flows, and the voices blend together in harmony. It's like you about hear the angels singing. It's like, whoa, yeah. How, how would you like to live in that on a regular basis? We say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, it, but it, you, God will not tolerate the, the mundane mediocrity of our religious lives or our, our chipping around at the edges and doing some things that we shouldn't do or acting in ways that are unclean. So I'm not going to, you get judged right, right quick there. Acts 5, 9. He said, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? And this is Sapphira. The feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. This is New Testament, folks. Not Old Testament, it's New Testament. Why there? Why, how many people have you seen lie to the Spirit and drop dead on the floor? I haven't seen any of those. I think, may be wrong on this, I believe that when the glory falls in this end time and when this whole thing is going south and God's going to raise up a, an end time testimony of the glory of God, uh, we may see that. Time will tell. And the final one is this, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty nine 29 through 31 and it's, it's reference to communion. Paul is writing to the Corinthians who are very loose around the edges. 
But the glory of God is on them. They're very raw recruits. The church has just started, and they're having communion. And they're defiling that communion. They don't wait for one another. They're going on ahead of one another. It's just like those priests of old. And they said, oh, we don't care. We're going to do... It's kind of like I think about that, you know, some of the ministers that are out there that they're looking out for those people's money. They want to use those parishioners and get their money from them. That's what's most important to them. It's not the, the fat, on, you know, the offering unto the Lord. They just get them all in there so they can get them in the chairs to get their money out of them. God will know that the heart of each one of them. But here, these Corinthians, read 1 Corinthians 11. It says, uh, okay, you're coming in here, but you don't discern the body of the Lord rightly. You don't, he said, what he said, you don't know what you're dealing with here. You've got a ritual and you're all just lining up and take the communion meal. He said, this, this is a, 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 an act of reverence and awe for what God has done in your life that he's redeemed you from death into life through the power and presence, through the blood of Jesus has washed you clean and you must discern by the spirit the awe of that trans transaction of who you are in Christ through that. Oftentimes, what it become? I remember back in the day, and even more, even after being saved, I didn't have a lot of teaching on this. It was just, let's, let's do the communion. Let's get that over with quick so we can get to the Word. Let's tag it on at the end here. Let's, get, let's, go, let's hurry up through this. Go. And, they, and they'd have these now, these cups. Uh, you know, they have the, 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 the juice in there, and they have on the top, they have the wafer. And the people wouldn't have it. They just throw it over. They throw them out. People catch them in it. And it's so, it's so carnal. There's no sense of the presence. There's no sense of deep gratitude, bowing before the Lord and discerning the body, his body. He said, you don't discern the body of the Lord rightly. And he goes on to say this. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, and they were amongst them, they dishonored that sacrifice, folks. Christ, in what he had done on that cross, they had no sense of awe of what had transpired. God coming to earth, wrapping himself in humanity and dying a brutal death by the people he created. All for you and for me. And we go, ho-hum, when do we get this over with? And we may not say it out loud, but let's not take too much time with this. We should take all the service with it. He who drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, the judgment, many are weak. They've got just physical weakness. And among, amongst you, there are those who are sickly. And some of you, some have died, ultimately. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. You better judge yourself. You better, you better deal with this deep within your spirit, whether you are a child of God and saved and you have, and you have brought your body and, and offered it to the Lord. And that's one of the questions. Have you intentionally offered up your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord? Think about that. You, what sacrifice? You. you. You're it. You get on the altar. You get up there. It's like Abraham and Isaac. Get, get on the altar already. Get up on there and you're done for. Now, he didn't plunge the knife into him, but uh, fundamentally, his life was over. You know, it's a picture of Christ and all of that idea. He said, no, we get, get up on that altar and you're done. Your life is over. You're dead to self. And now Christ will come and live in you. You'll be a holy man or woman of God. You, we better discern what we, where we are with the Lord. And if we're right with God, and then he wants to take you and move us to the next level. That's what he wants to do. He said, I'm, gonna, that, I'm not finished with you yet, but I'm, I'm looking for that holy priesthood. I'm looking for those people who are holy, make a difference between the, the clean and the unclean, the holy and the profane and you'll be a holy temple. Amen.